I want to talk for a few minutes this morning on it's almost supper time. It's almost supper time. (laughs) There are four suppers mentioned in the New Testament. We just did one of them, the Lord's Supper, communion. We remembered his death. Revelation 19 talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is not in the too distant future, I don't believe, the way things are going on this earth. It doesn't take someone with a whole lot of biblical sense to realize we're living in a different day. We are living in a different day. Uh, Globally, uh, I won't get into the political realm of this, but we haven't seen anything yet. But the Bible has warned us of last day characteristics. And I don't mean to put a damper and a wet blanket on your spirit today or anything like that. There's hope (laughs) because it's almost supper time. And that's a great time. When you like to eat as much as I do, supper time is a good thing to think about. Uh, Four suppers in the Bible, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Marriage Supper, the Lamb, And then in that same Revelation chapter 19, there is a supper referred to as the Supper of the Great God. It's the remnants of Armageddon and where the angels summon the vultures of the sky to come and eat up the dead that will be in that plain in Megiddo. Luke 14, hang with me as we read this scripture. Jesus has been invited to a Pharisee's house for Sunday mealtime. It's kind of like taking the preacher out to eat. (laughs) Hint, hint. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper. Uh, Supper time in the Middle East, it was the chief feasting time. Uh, The activities of the day were over. It was kind of a celebratory event to just to gather around and enjoy that meal together. Uh, It was a feasting time. Uh, A certain man gave a great supper, invited many. He sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go see it. I ask you, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I pray you have me, I ask you to have me excused. Much like today, everybody has an excuse why they can't come. uh, And we justify our excuses and we think they're very uh, rational and and reasonable. I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I I pray you have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife. (laughs) And life is over. I'm sorry. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> I married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. No question. She wears the pants in the house. So that servant came, reported these things to his master, then the master of the house being angry. Have you ever cooked and they not showed up? Ooh. Nothing irritates a cook more than that. I Cameron stays at the Shores house now more than he does at our house. Keith, you might can claim him on your taxes next year. I don't know how all that works, but I, I, he'd been over there all day the other day since early morning, and I thought, well, he'll be home for supper. So I get in there, and I cook a feast. And I text him. And I said, I got supper ready, baby. I'm eating at the Shores. Ooh. <laughs> You could have poured hot grits on me and it wouldn't have made me any madder. (laughs) 
you still live under our roof. <laughs> Being angry, he said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring here in the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. The servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded, and still there's room. We've done that. There's still plenty of room. The master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges. Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. Obviously, Jesus was speaking a parable at the time to the nation of Israel. God, in his mercy and grace, had hand-selected and chosen and picked them and given them, if you want to call it, a great banqueting spread, and they rejected it and refused the Messiah and are still looking to this day for their Messiah. And so they refused the invitation that the Master had sent out. Come, it's ready. The, the Messiah is here. The banquet is ready. Everything that you need, he's providing for you. And they refused it. So Jesus was speaking that particular parable to that group of people that day, still very applicable to us today. Now look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. John, the I don't understand everything about Revelation. <clears throat> I know at some point the church is raptured off of this earth and taken to heaven to be with Jesus. And then there's a marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place during that seven-year time frame. Um, I don't understand about all of that I know about that. I don't exactly know when the rapture will take place. I know we have preached it in all of our life and believed it, and I still adhere to it and want to hold on to that, that the rapture is before the tribulation. I know there are a lot of God-fearing people uh, David Wilkerson didn't believe that. He believed that the church would go through part of the tribulation. Leonard Ravenhill, the great revivalist back, said the church will go through probably the first part of the tribulation. I don't know. I, I don't have the knowledge and the capacity to understand that. I don't believe we really are to know that, to be honest with you. I know what the Word says, and I know what we've always preached, and what we interpret, what we believe to be uh, our getting out of here point. But uh, tribulation winds are certainly already blowing on this earth. Would you not attest to that and agree to that? Uh, and I know the Lord takes care of his own through whatever they go through. Uh, I've said, you know, Noah was not spared from the flood, but God kept him through the flood. Uh, say, well, you know, God has not appointed his children to wrath. No, he certainly has not. And he keeps his own. Uh, Jesus Christ is our security. He's our hiding place. He's our refuge. Um, and don't, don't you leave this church and say, well, Brother Jerry thinks we're going through the tribulation. I don't know when we get out of here. I know we better be ready to go. It could be at any moment. But when we do get out of here, it's going to be supper time. And there's going to be a marriage supper in heaven. And I don't know how God's going to do that. I don't know if it'll be a literal banquet table that all the redeemed of all the ages will gather around. There's going to have to be a huge banquet room in heaven if there is. And I don't know how he'll do all that, but it'll be a celebratory time unlike anything we have ever seen or experienced on this earth. I told you about that time. <clears throat> I used to get so aggravated with Brother Tommy telling the same stories over and over. Be careful how you talk about somebody because you may do it one day. I told you about that time that we took a trip to New York, a missions trip. And about two weeks before we were to go, Bobby Seddon was down at McDonald's with Austin and Eli. They were smaller at the time, obviously. And as Sister Bobby's nature was, she was always engaging someone in conversation and talking about the Lord. And she's engaged in conversation with this lady there at McDonald's in Bonifay. And I uh, come to find out the lady is from New York City, raised in Bonifay. Her mother uh, was a old Sister Matthews, uh, Sister Deb, you remember Sister Matthews, a little tiny short lady, old Pentecostal uh, preacher lady, holiness. And uh, her daughter had been raised up here in this area and had done well, had moved to Chicago and gotten in marketing and, and uh, fashion and just did really well for herself and then married a young banker 
in New York, who his dad owned a, a few banks, and so they were they were they were fair and well. <laughs> they were multimillionaires. Well, Bobby gets engaged in conversation with her, and she finds out she's from New York, and she says, "Well, our church is going to New York in two weeks on a missions trip." And the lady, "Oh, I can't believe a little, you know, a little Holmes County, Bonifay, Florida, you'd come to New York City to do a work for the Lord." And she gives Bobby a card and says, call me when y'all come. I want to treat y'all. And I'm like, yeah. I told Bobby, I said, you have to understand people like that, Bobby. I said, they don't mean that. I said, she was just being nice. She didn't mean she wanted to treat all of us. I said, there's 30 of us. Well, sure enough, we get up there and uh, the call is made and she says, well, I want to treat everybody. And she gives an address that we're to be at this place on 42nd Street, uh, it's 6.30 in the evening, and everybody, uh, the guys are all wear a shirt and uh, a coat and tie. I'm like, what kind of place is this we're going to? You've heard of being in high cotton? This was the highest cotton I have ever been in. <laughs> I assure you. And I know it can't compare to the great banquet that we're headed to in the sky, but this was the highest cotton I will ever be in on this earth. We walked up to this place. It was called the Brook Men's Club. Uh, there was a doorman that greeted us at a tuxedo on. We were escorted into one room where they, we were served hors d'oeuvres from these guys with these tuxedos on. And I, Elizabeth, didn't they have tail, the tuxedo tails and little jackets? And then we were taken into another room where we were served drinks, Coke, Sprite, water. I'm sure if it wouldn't have been a church youth group, the selection would have been a little different. And then finally, the maitre d' or whoever, I don't know the terminology, someone comes to the double doors and says the, the banquet is now ready. Opens these huge double doors to this table that in my mind now, I think it was as long as from here to the back of that door with huge chairs all around it, candelabras, silver candelabras, and immaculate, so much silverware at a place setting. I'm like, dear Lord, who was going to use this one plate right here? And it was high cotton. I have no idea of the amount of money this couple spent. Uh, we later found out he had had fresh fish flown in from New Zealand for that meal to feed everyone. And uh, we were trying to act refined. It's hard for Holmes County to act refined in that setting. We were really trying really hard. <laughs> and Brother Tommy was really trying. And they had on the table this little dish, uh, um, china, fine china. And I, you would have thought it was sugar. It was salt. Well, Brother Tommy, they asked coffee. Oh, yes, coffee. Well, Brother Tommy just starts scooping that salt in that coffee, <laughs> thinking it's sugar. And, uh, and then he drinks it, and he can't, he can't let on. He, you can see his lips kind of lock when he puts it up there, and he's like, dear Lord, I can't let on what I've just done. And the lady, the hostess, who was the millionaire's wife, sitting at the end of the table, she, said, she knew what was going on. She just busted out laughing and said, it's okay, Brother Tommy. said, that's salt. He said, yeah, it's sure not sugar. I can tell you that. <laughs> But you talk on about a banquet, and I know it can't compare to what God has in store for his church. The marriage supper of the Lamb. I didn't really mean to get off on all that. Revelations 19 and 6, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude. John is seeing this and trying to describe in his terms what he is seeing of this future event. The voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. King James, which I like King James rendering, says it's the righteousness of the saints. And we know that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He covers us. We're not righteous in ourselves. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. John is just so caught up in this moment, he's going to fall down and worship this angel who is giving this revelation to him. And the angel says, oh, wait just a minute, don't do that. I'm just a servant just like you are. I'm your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the, spirit of, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is Jesus obviously on the white horse. And this event is taking place while the tribulation is winding up on this earth, seven years of the most horrible time on this earth there's ever been. So obviously the bride of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, has been united with him and the rapture has taken place at some point prior, seven, somewhere in this seven-year time frame prior to this event happening. So we're in heaven with the Lord. And then heaven has to have a lot of stables because there's a pile of horses if we're all going to be on a horse. Am I right, Brother Randall? As heaven opened, behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. How many of you have never ridden a horse? Marie, you better get a little practice in. I think the last time I was on a horse, I got bucked off and it knocked me out. Uh, my sister and I, back in the day, had gone down to an old trash dump area and we were making a fort in the woods. And we were going to this dump and digging out old cans and stuff. And we tied them to the horse. And my sister said, you get on the horse. <laughs> I was much younger and thought, okay, I'll ride the horse not realizing that that clanging and banging would spook the horse. And he, he, the more we went, the more it clanged and banged, and he started bucking and rearing, and I, I went flying one way, and it knocked me out. And I remember coming to, I was twirling my fingers saying, where am I? Where am I? And I haven't gotten back on a horse then, but my, I don't think we'll be afraid of these horses Armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, clean and white, follow him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he, has, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together. Here's that other supper. For the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, those who were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Father, we thank you for hope today. Lord, we thank you that it's almost supper time. And it'll be a great day, Lord, a celebration with you when we behold you face to face. And our faith becomes sight, Lord, and we long for that day today. This world holds no enticement this morning, God. And we're longing for home. We're longing for you today. Prepare us, Lord. You said the bride had made herself ready. Prepare us and make us ready for your coming, Jesus. If we're not ready, wake us up in this house today. Amen. 
I want to focus on the first scripture that we read in Luke 14 for just a few minutes this morning. The great invitation that was sent out. He said a supper was made, a great banquet, and invitations had gone out. There was a great invitation to anyone and everyone that would come. And can I say this morning that the Lord has invited every one of us to his banquet table. And that invitation still goes out today. It goes out across the land. It goes out to Indonesia. It goes out to India. It goes out to China. It goes out to Laos. It goes out to every corner of this world. Wherever there is humanity, the invitation is going out. Come. There's a feast prepared. There's a banquet table that has been spread. You do not have to be hungry. Your soul does not have to be thirsty. What you're looking for, come to the table you will find the answer spread before you. And that invitation, can you not agree with me this morning, is going out through all the land. It has not stopped from the moment Jesus hung on that cross and he said it is finished. The invitation has been going out. Come, come to the table. Come to the table. Come taste. Come be refreshed. Come be re restored. I did a survey a few months back and I asked, in this church, I said, who, how many of us have invited someone to church this week? At best, I remember it was seven people. Seven of us out of a pretty large crowd that Sunday had invited someone to church. George Barna did a research study a while back of unchurched people. And the finding was that most unchurched people would go if they were simply invited but they feel like this is an exclusive club that if you're not a member of, you're not welcome and you don't show up and you're not a part. I think it's time, I think it is time, Carmel Assembly, that we start just opening our mouth and inviting people come to his table. Come and find what your soul is looking for. We have pointed out people's faults and failures long enough. Let's just extend an invitation and say, come. Let's let him work on them. Let's let them get a taste of him and see if he won't fix what is wrong in their life. I have determined of 56 years, you're not going to fix anybody. You're not going to save anybody. You're not going to free anybody. You're not going to change anybody. But if we can just invite them to the table... <laughs> I said, if we can just invite them to come and taste and see that the Lord is good, and if they'll just get a little taste in their mouth, they'll realize, this is probably what I've been looking for my whole life. This is probably what I've been searching for and longing for. So the invitation is going out. When Jesus hung on that cross, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. <laughs> the invitation is whoever. Say, oh, Brother Jerry, I've got a bad life. Whosoever. Oh, Brother Jerry, I've done this. Whosoever. Oh, Brother Jerry, I have a past. Who doesn't? Whosoever. Revelation, the very end of the book the last chapter, almost the last verse, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride are saying, come on. Let him who heareth say, come. That's you and I. We've heard the spirit. Now we're supposed to respond and tell others, come on. Come taste. Come. The table's being spread. There's a place setting for you. Oh, no, Brother Jerry, I can never fit at that table. My life has been so black. My life has been so bad. My life has been so dark. No, there's a table setting just for you. There's a table setting with your name engraved on it. Let him who is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The invitation. Now there is the guest list. Jesus said, when you give a feast, invite the poor. <laughs> invite the maimed, the lame, the blind. How many of you were spiritually poor one time in your life? How many of you were poor and crippled one time and you couldn't even get to the cross? 
But he reached down and found where you are, where you were. His long arm of mercy reached down. See, we are all benefiting from the invitation that has gone out. And sometimes we forget where we came from. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When you give a feast, invite the dignitaries. Invite the bankers. Invite the doctors. Dr. Hawkins, you're invited. Invite the attorneys. Where's Tyler? No, he went a little farther on down on the list, and he said, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind. In other words, seek out those that can't even really get to the feast on their own. Seek out those that don't even see their way to get there and make sure they have a special invitation. See, this great God, this great master who's preparing this feast and this great supper, he doesn't overlook anyone. You and I are bad to overlook people, and we write people off. Say, oh, they're beyond the mercy of God. They're beyond the grace of God. Let me assure you this morning, there's no one beyond mercy. There's no one beyond grace. And there's a table setting for everyone because the invitation is going out to everyone. I thought of this uh, verse of Scripture in Isaiah 58 where God is talking about the kind of fast that he requires. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light will break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, and you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry. He will say, Here am I. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, (laughs) the pointing of the finger, I have a good finger pointer. Well, that's the problem right there. It's that bunch in Washington's the problem. It's the abortionists that's the problem. It's the homosexuals that's the problem. I'd never really noticed it that, that that said that. He said, quit pointing the finger. Accept the responsibility and do what you're supposed to do if you want God to work for you. If you want your darkness to break forth and light shine on you, just do what you're supposed to do and quit pointing the finger at everything else. Because every time we point one, there's three pointing back at us. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. There was the invitation went out to everybody. There was the guest list who he specified who to really target. Oh, Brother Jerry, we can't get the poor and the afflicted and the blind. They can't pay the bills. Allison, you're an exception. No, that's who Jesus said to go after. He said, make sure they're at the top of your list. Why, Lord? Their number three is the recompense. He said, you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. You'll be blessed because they can't repay you. Well, when I do something for somebody, I want them to do something in return for me. He said, no, it doesn't work that way. What could we give back to the Lord in return for his grace, his mercy, his love, his peace, his salvation? What could you and I as mere mortal human beings possibly return to the Lord for the riches he has shown us? 
He said, these people that you need to invite, that's the reason you invite them because they can't do something in return for you. They can't pay you back. I preached a message some months ago on this very thought. Psalms 116, what shall I render to the Lord for his benefits toward me? I'll take the cup of salvation and I'll call upon the Lord. The psalmist said, how can I repay God for everything he has done for me? And he looks around and says, there's not one thing I can do except just take the cup that he's given me and I'll drink it to the full. And I'll call on his name. I said, you know how you show a cook you appreciate their meal? You eat the food. You know how you show the Lord you appreciate his salvation? You take it and you drink that cup. And you come back for more and you lift that cup up and say, God, I want another dose of that. I want another drink of that, Lord. That was so good. You keep coming back for more. And you and I, when the Lord extended an invitation to us, it was pure mercy and grace and love that he extended that invitation because there's not one thing we could do to repay him. There's not one thing we, oh, say, oh, but Brother Jerry, I drop my tie checking the offering every Sunday. Yeah, but we can't pay for the mercy and the grace of God the recompense, and there is the reward. He said, you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, Jesus was addressing this Pharisee who had invited him to his house for a meal. And then he goes into this dissertation about, if you're going to give a banquet, don't invite your friends or the well-to-do or those that can repay you. Invite the poor, the blind, the maimed, because they can't recompense you. He said, you're going to receive your reward at the resurrection. So what does that tell us as a church? You know what our focus needs to be? Our focus needs to be on getting people to the table. And then when we sit at that great banquet table, he's going to reward us. I I, I think just being able to sit at the table is going to be reward enough, just to be very honest with you. But there will be rewards for those who have gone out and sought people to get them to come to the table. We go through life so busy with life, we forget what our mission in life is. I said, we go through life so busy with life, we forget what our mission in life is. Our mission is not to make money and build houses and drive nice cars. That's wonderful. I like nice things and I want more of them. But my mission in in life is to represent Jesus Christ to a lost, hurting, dying world. And we get so busy living life, we forget our mission in life. You know why God has placed you on that job where you are? to be a witness for him. Wherever you have been planted, that's where you blossom and flourish and bloom for the kingdom. You might be the only light in your family, but you shine in that family. The rewards are coming. There were the excuses He said to him, a man gave a great supper, invited many, sent his supper, a servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, all things are ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground. I need to go look at it. The other said, I've bought some oxen. I need to go test them and see how they're going to work. The other said, I've married a wife. I can't come. I thought as I was reading that, you know, We bash those who made all those excuses. I've always just bashed them in my mind. I thought, how dare you stand the the master up? I mean, you have been extended an invitation to come to his table and eat. But then the thought hit me yesterday. What about us who are at the table and we act like we're full and we don't want any more? What about us who have been sitting at the table for some time and we just treat it like, uh, I wouldn't care for any more. I've I've really had enough. I appreciate it, Lord. Well, no, try this dish. Uh, Well, no, I wouldn't care for any more. I'm just a fool. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. Well, no, just try this over. No, I'm really, I've really had more than I would.
Blessed are they that hunger. There is such a danger to losing your hunger for the presence of the Lord. There is such a danger for just going through the ritual of religion and just getting your nose counted and your card punched, dropping the check and the offering. I've paid my dues. I've done my thing. I've always criticized those that didn't show up, but then it hit me yesterday. There are so many. We've been sitting around the table for so long. We think that it's about us. We think that everything has to be catered just to us. I thought of the story of the prodigal son. The younger son goes to the father and says, hey, I want my inheritance. Can't wait any longer. Give it to me. The father gave it. You know the story. He goes and blows all of it, riotous living, winds up in a hog pen feeding the hogs. Scripture says he would have eaten some of that, but he came to himself. A lot of people just need to come to themselves today. He says, I could go back to my father's house. My, my father's servants are eating better than I'm eating, living better than I'm living. He goes back, and the father's waiting for him. <laughs> the father's outside looking. I hope my boy's coming home today. I hope my son's, is that him? I see someone in the distance. And he gets there, and there's a celebration, there's a feast. Kill the fatted calf, bring my robe, bring my ring. And the older brother gets very mad. <laughs> the older brother gets very upset. Why this celebration? He has blown everything you gave him. Look how he's lived, and you treat him like this. And the father said, son, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. <laughs> Everything that the cross accomplished is for us today. Everything that Jesus accomplished on that cross is ours. And he says it's on the table. Would you come and get it? There's a place setting for you. I have prepared it. Everything I'm prepared, it's for you. It's yours right. You don't have to wait. It's yours right now for the taking. Would you claim it? Well, no, Lord, I, I've had a plenty. I've sat at the table so long now, Lord, I'm so full. I just want to take a nap. Then there is the urgency. The reward, the excuses, the invitation, the guest list, the recompense, the urgency. The servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly. Do not delay. You hear the urgency in his voice. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. The servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded. Still, there's room. We did this, Lord. We did this. Where is the urgency today in the church? Where is the urgency to pray? Where is the urgency to win the lost? Where is the urgency to reach people? Where is the urgency about the return of Christ? Where is the urgency of the Spirit anymore? Can we not open our eyes and look around and realize that Jesus Christ, we've heard it all our life and our ears have become dull, but we're living at the brink of the coming of the Lord. And much, I'm not talking about Carmel Assembly this morning per se. I'm talking about much of the church world has fallen asleep and have lulled themselves off. And we have lost the urgency of the moment. I read a David Wilkerson newsletter this morning, an old one. He said, one moment in eternity in the presence of the Lord, we will forget everything that this world had to offer. One moment sitting at that table, 
And he also said, one minute in hell and we would forever be forever changed. Where is the urgency about lost souls anymore? The Bible is explicitly clear about the characteristics of the last days. Paul told Timothy, perilous times, men love them on their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth, you know the story. Despisers of those that are good. He goes on to say they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. And if we're not living there, I don't know when we will be living there. The world has a form of godliness today. I read last week the Lutheran church ordained its first transgender bishop. I read the other day about the, wasn't it, was it the Baptist or Methodist? Thank God it wasn't assembly yet. The Methodist had ordained their first transgender, and she goes by the name of Penny Cost, Sister Penny Cost, and people were praising that we had arrived at that day. I read this story about this Lutheran bishop, Lutheran pastor in California, become the first transgender bishop in a major American Christian denomination. On Saturday, the Reverend Megan Rohrer, pastor at First San Francisco's Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church, elected bishop for the Sierra Pacific uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America based in Sacramento, California. The assembly encompasses 36,000 members. The Reverend Elizabeth Eaton, who was the presiding bishop, praised the conference for recognizing Sister Rohrer's talents and said, we, uh, we welcome her, we, uh, we welcome her talents and abilities uh, all are welcome, Eaton said in a statement. We believe that the Spirit has given us gifts in order to build up the body of Christ. We have a form of godliness in this day. And if it will wear a cross around its neck and total a Bible, it must be God. And there was the command... It went from an invitation to an urgency to, he said, go out to the highways. Go to the hedges. No longer just invite. You go compel them. Do whatever you have to do to get them to the table. Do whatever you have to do to get them in the house. It's almost supper time. There's going to be a trumpet that sounds in the future. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, she may look battered, <laughs> she may look tattered, <laughs> she may look torn, but she will rise in victory. And she will be called to the banquet table. <laughs> and our faith will become sight when we behold him on that moment. And there'll be an angel that'll escort us to our place setting. <laughs> and we will be in the presence of the Lord in all heartache and sorrow and pain and agony. It's almost supper time. You may be in this house this morning. And you may have lost your joy because of all that's going on. You may have lost your purpose. You may have forgotten that you're headed to a great celebration. You may have forgotten that you're going to be the guest of honor at a great banquet. I just want the Holy Spirit to remind us this morning where we're headed. Take your eyes off the, 
the mountain that's in front of you. Take your eyes off the problem that's hanging before you. Be encouraged in His presence. Be renewed in His Spirit. Be refreshed in His presence. If you're here this morning and you're not ready for the banquet, <laughs> oh, just call on His name. There's a place setting with your name on it. The table is prepared and you have a place there. Just call on him. Find his mercy. Find his grace. And let the Holy Spirit lay someone on your heart right now that you can invite to the table this coming week. 